this happened several years ago. Um, a student who um, really loves to write. He's he was a great he's a great writer, and um, he's also very critical. Not anymore, but was of himself, constantly getting in the way of his writing. So he wrote something and he shared it with me、um, and with another、uh, colleague. And we sat down to give him feedback and talk about, you know, strengths and weaknesses, <coughs> and、um, celebrate him. And、uh, when we shared the parts where he could, you know, improve, he got very self-critical.、Um, and th- this was his first year at Springhouse.、Um, he's now since graduated, and he crumpled up his paper and he threw it in the garbage. And、um, So we saw that as a moment, not just to strengthen this young person's writing, but to strengthen the nurturing, caring voice in him that wasn't there yet. So we invited this student to, and he was willing to go pull the paper out of the, the garbage. So he pulled it out, and he un he unravelled it, you know. And、um, I said, so I'd like you to go and draw. He also loved to draw. Draw a picture of what that voice in you that tells you this isn't good enough, you're bad, all of that. Draw a picture of it on the back of your writing.、Um, and so he did. He went away, came back with this black kind of、um, amorphous figure with red, r- small red eyes. And、um, he said, "This is what that that looks like inside of me."、Um, and then all along, we're asking him, you know, for consent, like willingness.、Um, And we said, you know, are you willing to share this、um, with a group of of friends? You know that we could facilitate a circle. And he said he was. So we all went outside, and、um, and this we we leave room for this kind of thing. So we all went outside, and he shared with his friends、um, about what this voice says to him, about how hard this is in relationship to his writing, and then we had his friends share back to him what they love about him. What they see in him, his strengths, and、um, basically model what that nurturing voice could sound like in him. So we all did that, and then at the end, in the center, we lit a fire, and、um, and he burned the writing and the paper, and he still remembers this. He's probably twenty now.、Um, he is in school.、Um, he's at、uh, a college down down here、um, for creative writing. So he's following that that path, but it's one of those memories I remember, and that that I could tell that story in a million different ways with different Springhouse students. But it was a powerful one in that、um, I realized how integrated things really are. That you know he he's a writer, but he's also someone who was really a self deprecator, and、um, and that both could be there and both could be tended to. And learning could be deeper than him just strengthening his writing. He was really strengthening himself.、Um, and what I would see is that the vitality. You know, this is one of my teachers, Angelus Arian, would say, "The fire that takes no wood. The fire that takes no wood is the fire within us. It's always burning."、Um, but whether we tend to or not matters.、Um, it matters how warm we get to feel from it, <laughs> and、uh, also how clearly we get to see because of its light. So. When I'd come in, we would foster this vitality. It would be very bright, right? It would be shining the light on、um, all kinds of things. But then after I would go, because the culture itself、um, wasn't there to even like lift it up in the first place, much of what we did would just kind of be、um, uh, overtaken by the culture at hand within that system. So one thing that felt very important to me when I came to Springhouse was、uh, community place based over time. I didn't want to do any more just one off workshops or what. Not that there's not value in those,、um, but I wanted to do something more sustainable,、um, place based. What I didn't realize, and here's the project that I'm working on now: when something does something new and restoring and renewing over time, whether it's a person or a place, it becomes an example. It becomes an example of what's possible, and that's what gives hope. That those examples. I mean, ideas they can spark something, but examples really are what can like solidify that hope and motivate people.、Um, and it can also support them.、Um, 
So I, like I said, I experienced that as a person in recovery when I saw someone who hadn't been drinking for 10 years or as a cancer survivor to see someone who survived the lymphoma that I did. It was like, oh my God, thank God um, that's possible. Well, that's what Springhouse is becoming. Again, not because it's the best, not because it's the only, but because we've just stuck with it <laughs> over eight years together. And that's a miracle to me. It's a miracle to me. Um, that we have and I love miracles. So we've stuck together and now we've grown both locally, but also nationally and internationally where people now are coming to us and saying, how are you doing this? I need support. Um, and so that's how we started these, this project that I'm working on the sort we, we articulated the design based on my doctoral work and also the experiment of spring house. So we had a focus group of teens and adults and community members, um, and we articulated these five design principles with Sourced Design Lab. So at Springhouse, the direct experiences are every week we meet for, I mean, specifically for two hours a week to really tend to the sacredness within ourselves and each other. That can look like a lot of different things. It can look like dancing, singing, having hard conversations, using theater to better understand ourselves. I mean, it's like a, a million different things, but it's set aside time. But really the rhythm at Springhouse is monastic. So it's always, we're always in it together. It's not like that's the only time we're doing that work. Um, it's an ethos that that's pervasive um, amongst, and that ethos is we orient around lives, our, life ourself, vitality ourself. And we do that through those meetings. We do that through peer mentoring. I mentor all the all of the staff um, around the intersection between their personal and collective work. There's a specific focus there for me um, and for us. So those are some of the ways that we we do a lot of retreats together. And um, we're there not to be teachers at a school, but to to be liberated and live free ourselves in order to, to share that with others. That. So for me, it's really about the source design network and creating infrastructure that supports people who wanna put vitality at the front and center of their own lives and in their communities. So this morning, I, I just had one of the first, I mean, I, I'm gonna have a monthly support group for the people who have gone through the lab. And I literally thought it would be me and maybe a Springhouse staff and the one person I meet with monthly. <laughs> And there were like 11 people that came from the network at eight o'clock this morning, coming in like one after the other into the Zoom room. And I'm like, okay, okay, here we are. This is what, so this is, I'm gonna start really slowly. We're gonna have the labs. We're gonna have the monthly support group. And then we're gonna have a, an annual gathering. We already have an annual gathering, but we're gonna open it up in May. And, um, and then people can come and immerse, you know, in the in the actual design itself and have like a whole four day thing where people can dance together and learn from the teenagers and hear hear all those stories from the teens about what it's like being immersed in something like this. Because ultimately, the vision that I have is to have a network of people who are putting vitality at the front and center of their design. Then we become a larger community is our greatest currency. So we become a larger, you know, interdependent community that's a stronger voice for vitality centered design, really, vitality centered design. Um, it's very personal to me. This is deeply, deeply personal to me. Um, I was, when I was 20 years old, I was a lost, hot mess, um, mostly with alcohol and relationship addiction. Lost, oriented around my ego. Nobody taught me that there was something larger than that. I mean, I had little glimpses in my life, but I didn't have any community or culture to remind me that I'm more than my ego. So I was doing what anyone would do and does do, is numb, numb and distract, because I, I just couldn't manage. Um, and then I had a mystical experience when I was 20, something I was very, very drunk out of my mind and really losing it. And something, a voice broke through inside of me and said, put the drinks down, you will never drink again. And I haven't had a drink since that was 30 years ago. And that was just the beginning. I mean, that was, once I heard that, 
and then I listened, which is a bloody miracle. That's all I can say. I don't know how that happened. And then I stayed sober at, at a university that I went to to party at um, and followed my boyfriend there to do that. Um, it's nothing short of a miracle. So what that experience, and then, then of course, it's been 30 years of being deeply wedded to that voice. That is, that is what I am wedded to. Um, I mean, I'm secondarily wedded to my husband, but I'm firstly married to the mystery of this life. And um, I make no bones about that because um, I know that nothing else is going to restore us. There's nothing... It doesn't matter what we call it. It's I see it in the earth. I see it every season um, where there's this power greater than ourselves, a life source that is turning the apple tree outside the window. I'm looking at it right now. It's green. And I can tell you six months ago, it was looked dead to me. <laughs> and now it's not. And it's going to provide apples for me. So we can't the human will has limits and when it's used to try to fix something that it can't fix i know firsthand um that is futile it is a futile effort the powers of dysfunction within a person a family system a culture are so wildly powerful it's like a harry potter movie right it's like those big huge things that <laughs> are so um the only thing um, that will restore us, you know, like I love the story of um, Narnia and little Lucy and Aslan, you know, it's like Lucy knew what to do. She went to find Aslan. <laughs> everyone else is trying to fight this thing. And she went in the forest and everyone was like, what is she doing? There's a huge thing going on out here. And she's like, went straight to Aslan who roared and raised the river gods. And that was the end of that story. right there. So, so, um, it's very personal to me because it restored me. That life source restored me and I've devoted myself to it ever since. And I know for sure we're just fractals of a larger thing. So when I look at the larger thing, what I'm mostly interested in is people who I don't, it doesn't matter what we name it. It's like there are a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground, as Rumi would say. That's not what's important to me. It's that a life giving source is at the center of a person's design or collective now i'm interested unfortunately and not that i am not interested in love other people but that's what i'm really interested in that's what i'm really interested in and unfortunately i don't hear that conversation enough um, i think that it, that's what brought me education is just a cultural leverage point it's a way to say you know what let's orient around something different other than destruction consumerism suffering let's orient around wholeness and the wholeness of life um, because I just know it's the only thing that will renew and restore us ultimately, collectively and individually. There's so many things, right? Thank God out there that are speaking about something ancient, but new because it's not well practiced, um, at least by many of us. Um, and what stuck out to me was the good intention and the, um, deep need and determination for something new, especially when it comes to how we approach education. <laughs>